session on artificial intelligence in endoscopy. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank the organizers, particularly Dr. Manoj Sahu and Dr. Aminas and uh, Dr. Sandeep Laktakia for giving me an opportunity to make this present presentation. Uh, artificial intelligence is very rapidly changing, changing and emerging area. Uh, and it has got integrated well into the endoscopy practice. Artificial intelligence basically refers to any technique which makes a computer or software mimic human functions such as learning and problems, problem solving. If you go through the different journals, you come across uh, editorials like this, which says that uh, artificial intelligence in gastroenterology walking into the room with little miracles. Uh, this is uh, so because the artificial intelligence is likely to become part of every endoscopy unit in very, very near future. And it, it will be dominating for quite some time. Uh, if you see PubMed search, make a PubMed search, in last one year, we have 107 papers on in gastroenterology uh, for uh, artificial intelligence. And in the field of hepatology, there are 31 papers. So you can understand how fast it is moving on. The term artificial intelligence was first coined by John McCarthy in 1956. That time it referred to basically solving simple algebra problems, but even that was miracle in that era. The second AI boom or the second phase came when the expert systems came. An expert system is basically is any algorithm which uh, tries to answer any specific uh, question of a specific, uh, based on a specific domain of knowledge. The third phase or the current phase is based on deep learning, the term which was uh, term and the system which was invented by Dr. Jaffrey in them. This was a major breakthrough and we'll just see what is uh, deep learning. So deep learning basically part of machine learning. So we train, we make a software, we train the machine for different things and then the machine is able to do certain tasks. So machine learning is of two, two types. One is representation learning, and the second is deep learning. So deep learning is a technique of machine learning with multi-layered multi neural network algorithm. So what is this multi-layer? This is basically uh, what basically the brain of, uh, of the computer and which works like a human brain. The machine learning like a human brain learning is also of three types. So this is supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforced learning. So in the, in the deep learning, what happens that there is input, which can be in the form of either images, sound, or any text input, or uh, any of the data, which goes through multiple layers of processing, and each node is given certain weightage, and final processing is filtered through different filters and then it, there is an output. So the, the heart of this, uh, the main force, main, uh, the thing, uh, the uh, brain behind this uh, whole system is called artificial neural network, which works like a normal human brain and has layers of neurons. And each, the output of one layer of neuron works as a input for the next layer. And each node is given a weight and then uh, during further processing, the uh, output is adjusted. So uh, uh, deep learning art architecture provides a large number of layers, very, very large number of layers. So there are two types of deep learning networks or artificial neural networks. One is recurrent neural network. This is used mainly for speech recognition and convolutional neural network. This is mainly used for images, which we dominantly use in endoscopy. So this is how it works. There is an input of image. There can be input of sound. And then we have lots of layers of hidden images, which process in output from one layer becomes input for the second layer and so on and so forth. And then there are lots of filters which process uh, those things. And ultimately we have output and we'll recognize the system will recognize this is a cat or this is the sound of the cat or dog and uh, so on and so forth. So ultimately it has to translate into a real a reality and what we are seeing is called actual reality. And when computer makes a projection of the same, then we call it a virtual reality. 
and what we are concerned actually is with augmented reality the augmented reality there is no created scenario is state an actual event is being altered in real time which is significantly enhanced robot like robotic surgery so you can see this like a real image then we have imaging and then imaging based on imaging the vessels perforators veins everything has been marked on a superimposed image and this is uh, what is called ar goggles similar things is being applied in endoscopy and that we will be seeing in a short while so this is hierarchy that artificial intelligence can be from the basic level uh, as i have discussed just now or this can be machine learning representation learning and finally we have deep learning and now we are progressing towards the network deep, deep learning so there are lots of software related to ai use in endoscopy have come out and these are the ones which have got the approval and on the forefront of is these are our uh, endoscope manufacturing company and some of the some of the accessories making companies and these are the licensed one but not far behind there are other others uh, which are uh, equally good or maybe even better they are waiting for approval and uh, these are likely to come in the near future so we start with the application in colonoscopy so it has been used for detection of polyps characterization of polyp distinction of malignancy versus non malignant lesion and for the inflammatory bowel disease in inflammatory lesions so in each of these area lots of articles have come up in last one or two years in lots of information is going in i am showing you this is the system developed which is called indobrain i this is the system developed by olympus olympus group and whenever there is a poly this yellow things comes comes up and this will give a probability what is the probability of uh, being a adenoma there another another part of the software this is called endobrain plus and this is able to distinguish between the non neoplastic and neoplastic here it is showing a lesion which has got a 99% probability of being malignant another software this is from pentex you are able to see often you will no may not be able to realize that there is a adenoma out here the system detects this marks it for taking the guided biopsy so this makes our life easier similarly another system from the uh, fujinon corporation uh, manufacturers of fujinon uh, uh, endoscopes this is uh, is showing the adenoma showing the position here and this is showing its interpretation so this is neoplastic this is not uh, like juvenile polyp or uh, inflammatory polyp this is neoplastic polyp so one has to deal accordingly <coughs> accordingly this is a flat lesion on the same same system again this is able to detect Uh, mark the area for taking biopsy and even 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 inside the lesion the best uh, site for the uh, taking site for taking biopsy is marked so lots of these uh, systems have been tested for detection of adenoma and wide light endoscopy what we see uh, in the standard high definition endoscopy the adenoma detection rates improves by certain percentage 10 to 15% in most of these studies so with use of this ai software we are able to detect more adenoma more accurately to distinguish them so lots of papers have come up on that and uh, here is the meta analysis of uh, five papers and it shows that uh, this technique is effective in diminutive polyp in medium sized polyp as well as in large polyp and it works in proximal colon as well as in distal colon so the technique seems to be reliable and seems to be working well in respective of size or the place of the poly so the the software can also be used for characterization of uh, these polyps whether these are uh, neoplastic polyp or non neoplastic polyps and they do it pretty accurately uh, and average accuracy is 90% plus meaning thereby that it is possibly suitable for use in routine clinical practice so this is the review article which appears just 3 months back and it says that in colorectal polyp detection and classification ai can provide clinicians with assistance in establishing the diagnosis by providing concurrent objective aspects multiple studies have showed that computer aided software could provide real time optical biopsies comparable to expert performance 
So now we see in the esophagus. So esophagus, lots of clinical challenges there. The legal cytokine staining, which is used for detection of uh, squamous cell carcinoma, or if the uh, one is able to see the lesion, the depth of invasion is difficult to assess. So we have lots of paper coming on these aspects. And in Barrett's esophagus and uh, adenocarcinoma of esophagus, we have uh, difficulty in uh, mapping out the Barrett's, the suspecting the dysplasia, suspecting the malignancy, and we have lots of paper coming on this. So we will see the example. So lots of systems are available for that. And uh, image enhanced endoscopy, we are already aware. Then we have VATS. VATS is basically wide area transepithelial sampling. This includes abrasive sampling followed by identification of abnormal cell. Then we have volume laser endomicroscopy. This is basically optical coherence tomography based system, which uses AI. And then we can uh, combine AI with different image enhancing technique like eye scan or uh, narrow bending imaging. This is a system which is uh, showing the Barrett's epithelium and the system, when there is nothing, then uh, the this green line, the bar is here in the safe zone uh, or very low probability zone for any malignancy. But similarly, when we see this lesion, the it is the system is able to mark the lesion, fix the uh, suggest the site for biopsy, biopsy, and it shows that almost 89% probability of having a malignancy. Similarly, you can see in this there is no the bar is here in the green zone. Whereas here, the bar is in the red zone, in the zone of 90%, and then it marks the area which should be sampled, and base probability area is further marked. So similarly, in squamous cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma mostly based on the magnification NVI images, and here we see the magnification NVI, NV, NVI uh, images, and here we see that this is most likely uh, squamous cell carcinoma of esophagus with SM2. Uh, invasion. So <clears throat> this is, I just now mentioned that volumetric laser endomicroscopy. This is based on optical coherence tomography. And again, AI is able to mark the suspicious area in different color. <clears throat> so AI assist has been uh, providing a reasonable specificity and sensitivity for the diagnosis of malignant, malignant lesion. And uh, that decreases the miss rate for esophageal cancer. Uh, even by the most experienced of the endoscopist. Now we have in gastric cancer. So there, when we see lesion, there is differentiation, issue of differentiation of cancerous versus non-cancerous. And then there is issue of interpretation of depth of invasion, which is mainly based on the uh, NVI finding. So we have lots of paper coming on, on that. And here we see an area which is suspicious. The software AI says, that this is early gastric can cancer with 98% probability. So we have to take biopsy for confirmation. And this is the appearance of uh, gastritis, chronic gastritis. And this is the NBI image of uh, early gastric cancer. So in uh, artificial intelligence detects these and will suggest to take biopsy and also guide through the area. Another image of early gastric cancer with the AI software. So, <clears throat> Uh, this AI-based application can help in taking biopsy and that increases our ability to pick up this cancer and it is fairly re reliable. Uh, this is interesting study which studies the utility of whether this uh, AI assisted assistance improves the uh, outcome or improves the pickup rate. So they categorize endoscopist as junior and senior and this AI assisted assistance was able to improve the outcome in both the category of junior and senior endoscopist. So <clears throat> this uh, AI based uh, uh, softwares have also been used for detection of H. pleuri during endoscopy. And there are different patterns which are described for active H. pleuri infection and post eradicated uh, gastric mucosa changes. So if we say this is a software, which is this, this image. So the software interprets this and says that currently infected, this is probability of around 88.7% or post eradication probability is 2.2%. So this is virtually confirms that this is active H. infection. 
so that is able to detect so multiple studies have come out on this and here is the meta analysis of six studies and it shows that there is a pretty good uh, sensitivity and specificity of these uh, softwares similarly the ai has found a wide application in capsule endoscopy for detection of lesion detects assessment of mortality uh, to improve the image view and uh, to assist the um, operator which is endoscopist by deleting the duplicate and uninformative images we already have system available which automatically detects the lesion automatically detects blood and all, all those have pretty good sensitivity and specificity for uh, in different studies so <coughs> detection of a small bowel bleeding is part of the software already i discussed with you and when we talk of bleeding and your dyspepsia all these have been studied including worms villus atrophy of uh, for the study of celiac disease and multiple lesions and very good sensitivity and specificity can be achieved with all these ai enabled softwares so they are able to detect with pretty high reliability so ai has also found application been ivd related uh, endoscopy for detection of activity detection of uh, crohn's lesion uh, then uh, for prediction of uh, remission and prediction of uh, uh, mucosal healing and lots of studies are coming up so when we see this that for histologic inflammation the accuracy was 91% for uh, mayo score also it was pretty good endoscopic mayo score for endoscopic severity this was also pretty high sensitivity and specificity and for endoscopic remission also pretty high sensitivity specificity this is uh, very interesting this is we have been uh, reading prediction of uh, outcome in non very cell bleed by rockal score and uh, glasgow score and here we if we concentrate here the blue and orange line are Uh, uh blue line is uh, rockal score and orange line is uh, uh, glasgow score so what we see here these are four uh, ai based algorithm which have been tested against these two scores and all four seem to perform better for prediction of mortality hypotension and deep bleeding so future in all these scores will actually be replaced by this ai enabled software which is most likely this is uh, very interesting ai can we come very handy for diagnosis of uncommon or rare lesion we are in the process of developing a software automatic software for automatic detection of uh, lesions recording of lesions taking images reporting and automatic generation of reporting during that course of uh, uh, when we are taking uh, training images we came across this patient we were not very confident about what uh, what is this lesion so the software tried the uh, open uh, uh, sources in the internet and suggested that this is ectopic sebaceous gland we took the biopsy submitted and it showed uh, mature sebocyte so confirming the diagnosis so this can be another application but still it is in the evolving phase there are lots of limitation with the ai system there is lack of good quality data set Uh, there is heterogeneity in different strategies in training and testing software there is wide variety of performance matrices and there can be limitation there are very few randomized trials available as of now we are likely to see in coming years a lot more and then there is black box model limitation that that is refers to preventing the physician from find, finding the confounding factors physician doesn't know what is the confounding factor so cannot correct and then there is issues of integration of therapeutic advances with this uh, ai softwares so i will summarize that this is a artificial intelligence is rapidly getting incorporated into endoscopy it can improve the detection rate of various gi lesions it can improve the accuracy of diagnosis of various gi condition it helps the endoscopy circumvent the learning curve lots have been achieved and lots are in the pipeline uh it can found a variety of innovative application in the training endoscopist checking the quality of endoscopy audit of endoscopy record keeping and it can save the time of endoscopist thanking you
morning, everybody. I'll be speaking on endoscopy training in COVID times. Endoscopy training has significantly changed in the COVID era. In the pre-COVID times, there was unrestricted flow of patients, a large number of endoscopies, and an easy access of the student to the trainer, which allowed an unrestricted, easy learning process. However, during the COVID era, the amount of training has been highly inadequate. Post-COVID, we need to plan so that we can resurrect the training process for our trainees. In the pre-COVID era, the training was dependent on four components. The first was acquiring knowledge. Second is acquiring skills, applying the skills under supervision of the mentor, followed by doing it independently and assessing the response of the patient to that particular procedure. A committed trainer went a long way in facilitating this process and high endoscopy volumes was also a key facilitator. A GI trainee daily goes to the GI clinic, goes to the GI ward, goes to the GI emergency, and goes and does endoscopy in the endoscopy suite. In the process, he learns to integrate all the components of clinical and endoscopic care, short term and its long term outcome. He or she usually acquires endoscopy skills by observing faculty, watching specific videos, performing endoscopy under supervision, and later on performing independent endoscopy. However, the COVID pandemic has disrupted all of this. This process was designed over a 50 to 100 year period, which has all been shattered by one COVID pandemic. The COVID scenario in India says that most of our states are affected by COVID, which has resulted in reduction in the number of inflow of patients and which has also resulted thereby a decrease in the number of patients coming to the emergencies, as well as reduction in the number of procedures like surgeries, endoscopies in all these centers. Before COVID, our OPD used to be like this. There used to be hardly any place to move around with a large patient load and hence a huge amount of clinical material on which our residents could learn. However, it used to be also so difficult for us to even enter our own OPD rooms because there were a whole lot of patients waiting. We had to do various crowd control measures to ensure that we have free space to move around in our OPD. But now, because of the COVID pandemic, there is significant reduction in the number of people who can be there in the, endos in the waiting areas of the OPD. And there is a significant reduction in the number of people who are in our waiting areas. So the footfalls have gone down. The clinical cases available for discussion with the residents has gone down. So the spectrum has become very narrow and inadequate for the training process. Residents first love is endoscopy. They like seeing endoscopy. They like doing endoscopy. They like talking about endoscopy, learning about endoscopy. And I can understand because for most of them, it may become their main bread and butter. It is also a very essential component for any gastroenterologist to be acquainted with all the components of endoscopy. So maintaining endoscopy training is an essential component in a training of a gastroenterologist. However, the endoscopy training has taken a beating because of the COVID pandemic. There's a fear of aerosol transmission. There's a fear of fecal-oral transmission. There's lack of PPE, that is personal protective equipment, in various centers. There's reduction significantly in the number of cases coming for endoscopy. There's restriction of personnel in the endoscopy suite. 
this restriction of the number of trainees performing endoscopy because we want more trained people doing endoscopy to reduce exposure to any medical personnel. So the brunt came on the trainees training. During endoscopy, nowadays you have to wear a whole lot of protective gear, which can become uncomfortable, difficult in warm areas. And the senior person is the one who's doing the endoscopy so that it is just one person exposing himself or herself to the patient. This has significantly reduced the number of trainees doing endoscopies. Moreover, there is a concept of service before self because trainees have been deployed to medical units, to emergency units, to COVID areas. And once they go to any of these areas, they could contract COVID and hence they go on quarantine, which can last from seven to 14 days. If they develop any fever or are exposed to any COVID positive people, then they are considered as COVID suspects, which means they undergo a testing, then a quarantine cycle, and all of their colleagues also go through testing and quarantine. This results in a layoff of a large number of people from the gastroenterology department. Thus, they remain banished from the endoscopy area. The residents thus are under stress. There's COVID fatigue, there's burnout, they're worried about their own future, they are worried about the future of gastroenterology. The time is running out because they are for a stipulated period of three years with us. Pregnant women, residents with comorbidities are usually not allowed to carry on with procedures so that they may contract infection. So all these worries pile up on our GI trainee. There's anxiety, burnout, fear that the society which is living around his house may not appreciate the fact that this doctor goes and exposes himself to possible COVID positive people on a daily basis. There's concerns for family members, this fear of not acquiring endoscopy skills, which he can't really discuss with everybody. And there are no academics, no conferences, no live demonstrations, no on-site visiting faculties. And this has hampered the learning of a GI training. There's also regression of milestones. Why? Because after MBBS, you do MD in internal medicine and then go on to do DM in gastroenterology. But however, during the COVID pandemic, we needed a large number of internists and physicians who could take care of COVID patients. So a large number of our DM trainees were deployed in COVID hospitals to function like internists. So there was a regression of milestone, though this is a part of clinical care for our patients and our duty towards the society. It did hamper the definite training of our DM students nevertheless. Endoscopy training was assessed in Germany in a tertiary care institution and it was found that compared to 2019 there was a significant reduction in the number of cases who were taken up for endoscopy and the number of trainees who got access to doing these endoscopies during the COVID pandemic. The impact of COVID-19 was seen globally in a study in the United Kingdom. There was a significant reduction in the total number of procedures which were done during the COVID pandemic. The endoscopies, the colonoscopies, the ERCPs, the EUS and the upper GI bleed, all of them significantly reduced. Moreover, the trainees got very little access to these procedures. And you can see that the trainee got only one ERCP and then he got very little number of colons and very little number of upper GI endoscopies. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic on training, there are global perceptions of the GI and hepatology fellows in US. A study done on 177 fellows showed that 30% were deployed to non-GI services, 50% had partial restriction in endoscopy, and 60% felt that it would impact their endoscopy skills. 
in another study on impact of COVID-19 on endoscopy training, an international survey of 770 trainees from 63 countries, it showed that 99% reduction in endoscopy happened in all these places, especially significant reduction in colonoscopy. 72% were concerned that the training will be prolonged, 52% were anxious, and 19% had burnout. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic was also seen in Australia, and interestingly, in this study, they have shown that there is a significant reduction in elective endoscopy. So usually elective endoscopy is very important for the resident training, and this having been reduced resulted in significant loss of clinical uh, cases on which our young residents would train. So the trainee nevertheless got frustrated and were looking around for alternate sources in the form of social media like Twitter, endoscopy focused journals, online courses of GI society, distant learning programs from institutions, and 38% were not looking around anywhere and may actually have been frustrated. When we looked at the endoscopy numbers in PGI, we found that we, on an average, do about 150 procedures a day, which includes upper GI endoscopy, lower GI, ERCP, EUS, advanced endoscopic procedures like POEM, and ultrasound-guided interventions. During the COVID pandemic, you can see that there was a significant reduction represented by the red bar in all these procedures and advanced procedures were totally minimized. However, now for the last one month, there is a steady increase in the number of procedures and we are doing them with all the precautions which are required for COVID pandemic. We conducted a survey among the GI fellows of our country, 55 responded on e-platform and we asked them, what do they think are the reasons for reduction of endoscopy during COVID-19? They felt that lack of cases was the most common reason because of which they were not getting endoscopy. PP was a cause in about 14% of them. 13% took personal decisions of avoiding endoscopy. It was a part of institutional policy in 42% and 20% of them were deployed in other areas which resulted in reduction in endoscopy. This Google form was made by Dr. Pankaj and Dr. Sachin who are both SRs in our department. Reduction in institute case volume was an important cause of reduction in endoscopy because the total inflow of cases had reduced. Also, the emergency cases had significantly reduced because of which emergency endoscopy were reduced. So residents got less access to see therapeutic endoscopy. There was a fear of exposure of COVID during endoscopy. 13% were extremely concerned, 49% were moderately concerned, and 38% were slightly concerned that they will contract COVID during endoscopy. We realized this, and that is why protected them with high-quality PP during their endoscopy. 20% of the respondents felt that they had inadequate PP from other institutions. In PGI, all the respondents felt that they had adequate PP. There was concern regarding prolongation of the endoscopy training. Uh, it was extremely concerning in about 28% and moderately concerning in 26%. So we realized they needed to bridge the gap and they may fall actually through the cracks. So we realized we have to bridge their training process. Otherwise, their frustration might make them do something foolhardy. Solutions for a crisis means adaptation. It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the more intelligent, but the one who's most responsive to change. So we realized as trainers, and managers of human workforce, we have to first adapt and change. So how did we respond? We realized, first of all, they needed support, psychological support, emotional support, support physically in terms of adequate 
food and uh, during the COVID pandemic and lockdown period. We realized that they need safety is paramount, that we provided them high quality PP and easy access to PP. We provided training to them in whichever way it was possible. So protected them, reduced their exposure by restructuring the endoscopy schedule, de-stressed them by maintaining communication network, understood their concerns, involved them in decision making, and we continued their training process by keeping one post-DM senior resident doing all the procedures for the day, and he is the one who will be leaving the institute first. So we realized that we should focus on him or her to ensure that they are adequately competent. All the endoscopies were supervised so that there was sufficient mentoring going on. We initiated virtual academic programs and continued GI simulator based training. We have a GI mentor model in our institute, which we used amply to continue their training process. We also conducted the fourth PGI-GI emergency virtual program for PGs in October 2020, and we are starting an e-endoscopy partshala this January, which will run last Friday of every month, which is dedicated for postgraduates. So active engagement of postgraduates in a learning program focused on them keeps their uh, stress levels down and improves their skill set. We also conducted two DM exams, and this was by a different format. So we had to counsel them prior to the exam, focus on one-to-one -one teaching, keep them off clinical duties prior to the exam. And the exam was case-based, scenario-based uh, examination, and quite often had to be virtual. And we also took the additional measure of testing the students, the patients, and the examiners for COVID so that there is no inadvertent transmission and stress of transmission during the exam process. We limited our expectations from them because we knew that they were under stress. We also tried to introduce new ways of learning. E-learning was something we encouraged so that our residents participate in various virtual programs. We increased the amount of simulator use. We had also considered animal models, but because of uh, all these fine flus, we think that that may not be a good model right now and continued with tele-demos. Simulation-based learning is very useful, especially in such kind of situation. The traditional learning model for surgery is C1, do one, teach one, but we cannot do that during the COVID pandemic. So we shifted to simulation-based learning. However, there are studies required to understand the impact of this kind of a learning process in the training of our residents. Simulators are of various type. We have the GI mentor and within the simulator, there are various haptics which will help us understand whether the resident is doing a good job or not. Adding a trainer to the simulator is an interesting way to improve the efficiency of this model. With the trainer, the learning process is faster and more customized for each of the residents. So what can the trainer do in addition to the simulator? He can clearly define the aims, match the procedure to the trainee, focus on the trainee skills, reinforce correct skills, and set a time limit. He can also introduce a structured stepwise training module in which first the resident learns about the theory of the procedure, undergoes a self-assessment, then performs a standardized technique in front of the mentor, then assesses himself, then performs a complex technique in front of the mentor and reassesses himself and finally ends up achieving the skill. If he fails at any particular step, he can start back from the previous step and go upwards. Animal-based models are another way by which we can keep up the training going on. However, the swine flu is another issue which is cropping up right now. Earlier on, the trainee had so much of access to patient and trainer and uh, he would learn a large part of his gastroenterology with great ease. The institution provided the framework and the societies 
provided the guidelines and the trainee learned his skills in about three years time. However, we have to now focus on the trainee. All the four of us have to focus on the trainee and make his experience worthwhile. So what can the trainers do? They can adapt to the new situation firstly. They can innovate. They can ensure that even if the case load is low, they efficiently manage to convey the key aspects of clinical decision making to the students and at all times ensure safety of the young trainees is maintained. What can the trainee do? He can engage with the trainer on a virtual platform. He can engage with simulators and do more and more simulator basic and advanced modules. He can go on to various virtual learning platforms and participate and learn actively there. And he should engage with his peers to remain de-stressed as well as to know what is happening in the world around him. What did our hospital do? It provided high quality PPE. We had a special committee to look at the PPEs and ensured that very early in the pandemic, we had stocked ourselves with good quality PPE. We provided motivational and emotional support to our healthcare workers and especially our residents. We had a special team from the psychiatry department which was providing psychological support and we had various helplines open for them. Our director tried to increase the senior residency program by additional three months with salary so that these students who did not manage to learn what they needed to learn got an additional three months to hone up their skills. All our healthcare workers have now started getting vaccination. We also have started opening our endoscopy services gradually with caution. We right now are doing about 50 procedures a day. Wearing a mask has been made mandatory for all the patients, all the staff and all the relatives of the patient. The hospital academics is largely on an e-platform. And we also have encouraged our residents to look at the various e-learning modules made by various societies, guidelines made by various societies, various videos and various forums which are being organized by the various societies. What can the GI society do? It is very important that the GI societies realize that GI fellowship programs are very coveted. And unless we take care of this issue of training for endoscopy, GI fellowship may lose its coveted status. So the training should be in the form of e-conferences, PP guidelines, the curriculum needs to be restructured for exams. We need to bring in flexibility in the curriculum. We need to innovate by bringing in new training modules, which are simulator based and video based, and also bring in telemedicine into our daily practice. The future of GI is in your hands. All of us have to make endoscopy practices safe and keep it as a norm even after COVID goes away. Do focused workshops for each procedures. In Singapore, a sprint workshop was done for rapidly acquisition of skills for endoscopists, making teleteaching a routine, introducing similar based, simulator based learning and creating archives so that we can access even when there are no patients. Endoscopy training, how can we go forward? We can use simulators, we can have dedicated trainers on simulators as well as on the limited number of cases that we have. We can continue e-learning programs. From here, we have to move on to endoscopy under trainer supervision as soon as possible and move on to independent endoscopy. Decision making is very important in clinical care. We have to decide whether a patients needs endoscopy or other interventions and with teleopd it is difficult to decide always however we are training our residents to hone up their skills in communication and understanding the patient problems and making decisions on the telephone 
We have also started limited physical OPD, that is on tele-OPD patients who are having problems, we call them in so that we can quickly examine them and take a decision. With that, we have to move to clinic-based approach after this. So what have we learned from COVID? We have learned COVID from COVID. That means we have learned to communicate better with our residents, with our peers, with our families, with our uh, community and society. We have learned to organize and reorganize our skill as well as our departments. We have learned to use various virtual platforms for learning and communication. We have learned how infection transmission happens and how we can control. We have learned to develop models which can help in training as well as in running the system. So basically, we have learned to adapt. So the take home messages are COVID pandemic has disrupted the existing learning process. Adaptation is key to survival. We need to protect our trainees and our staff. We need to support them because they are under greater stress than what we realize. We need to train them using simulators, animal-based models, e-learning models, and whatever cases come, we have to enhance their experience of learning a case-based scenario. And we have to have dedicated trainers who take it upon themselves to train our young trainees. So it is in our hands to build the next generation of gastroenterologists in the country. Thank you. Thank you both the speakers. Uh, both the talks were excellent and very informative. Uh, there are no questions from the audience. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Sinasaf one question. How will uh, artificial intelligence going to impact J endoscopy in future? Whether it's going to change the way people do it? Uh, definitely it is going uh, it is going to part and parcel of our endoscopy suite and it is going to stay there, stay there for long. And uh, my perception is that it is uh, going to drop. Only the problem which I'm seeing currently, that for each and every aspect, you need a dedicated software. So you will require multiple softwares, and I don't know how much you will one will be able to afford, and the cost will be a prohibitive uh, issue. That is the most important. And because this is a very, very uh, rapidly changing area, so that cost will be a recurrent cost. So that is that has become the biggest issue. But ultimately, we have to live with it. Uh, we have to learn to use uh, use it uh, as efficiently as possible. And uh, this is going to expand our horizon. This is going to expand our region. This is going to expand our uh, accuracy. Uh, will uh, doing biopsies come from uh, implementation of artificial intelligence or? Uh, that is going to take some time because the gold standard will uh, remain the biopsy confirmation. So that is uh, that will take time. But uh, if you see many, many things uh, are uh, simplified, like you are doing capsule endoscopy. When we started with capsule, the biggest time was, uh, biggest issue was the time uh, taken to review that. Then we had multiple viewers. Then we had uh, the automatic blood detection system in, integrated in the capsule endoscopy system. Now you have multiple uh, uh, lesions can be detected. So you don't need to go through meticulously. You can go, go to rapid view. You can take a multiple view. And then in the restricted uh, segment, you can review. So that solves the, has uh, made our life simple. So similarly, when we are doing uh, endoscopies, uh, like in the course of development of the software which I was talking, then what happened that lots of small lesions, which are overlooked by endoscopies, those are actually picked up by that. So this has a tremendous possibility that what this can be used for audit of quality, quality of endoscopy. This can be used uh, on the trainees that how many lesions trainees are missing, how many lesions trainees are uh, reporting erroneously. So all this will come into that. So even in the training, I, I see the biggest application, which at the moment is lagging behind, is in the uh, audit and uh, uh, training part. And this is, uh, to my mind, is uh, uh, 
uh, very very exciting uh, and this is going to change the training scenario completely like uh, dr rosa was uh, telling the, about the gi mentor so the endoscopist learns how to introduce sees the lesion but how will he identify common and uncommon lesions so here you will have ai so the <clears throat> catalog will be enormous and say if imagine somebody who is doing in a peripheral center comes across a lesion which he is not able to identify what help he has available ai will be will come handy there and will help to identify uh, and solve the issue there. thank you sir uh, one question to uh, usha madam uh, how are you uh, trying to compensate whether you are going to increase the duration of training or uh, duration of uh, exposure to endoscopy in the coming months to years so what we have done dr bharat is that uh, people who are senior residents with us because we are an institution so we have requested our director to allow them to stay for three more months so it's a paid position for another three months in which we categorize our procedures and the simple one goes to the younger trainees and the more difficult and complex ones to the more senior trainee and we ensure that they have a competence level before they exit the institution that's one thing the second way is we have what we call as pool officer positions that is senior research associate positions from csir so our residents write projects and once the project is approved by csir they continue to stay with us for another year we are planning to introduce advanced gi fellowships so that that becomes also another way by which they can stay on so i think it is one is case load in which you know there's a lot of passive learning going on once we make them engage with the case which is in front of them use that as an index case then there can be learning around it so it is not necessary that we have to have a huge number of cases that is one component i understand but in the absence of that we have to ensure that whatever case is done we learn more out of it more discussions around it and thirdly we are started the process of increasing our number of endoscopies we have now adequate pps everywhere we have a standardized protocol of all patients of covid tested before they come in we are reducing people in the waiting area so that there is lack of transmission there so our residents are right now happy with whatever is happening and uh, they are all getting their due structured training uh, we will have to speed up once covid kind of subsides and the vaccination is in place but we will continue with the precautions because So there can be a new mutant covid around thank you madam uh, any questions from the panelists or chairpersons dr manjuna dr manjuna yeah i have a question for dr sinha now that we have let the dr sinha now that we have let the computer learn from us can we now learn from the computer can we use the artificial intelligence see what the computer has to tell us and use that for our training programs so that that is what exactly i was talking that uh, we can check uh, when the trainees are uh, working actually they 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 can learn from the computer that uh, there are set of set of uh, lesions uh, maneuvers uh, procedures which the trainees will be asked to perform and trainees will identify the lesion perform the procedure do the maneuvering and the computer will be seeing computer will be watching and at the end of it computer will correct that what are the places corrections are required what was the diagnosis of the given lesion so computer will be teaching the trainees and computer will also be grading and in a way what we call currently in the current system we call assessment uh, or exam so that also will be taken by computer and that gives that uh, endoscopy is accuracy is 77% 85% 95% so that will be will be very helpful because when the learner is learning on mentor at the moment what we are doing he is learning on the mentor after a set period we ask them to perform on a real period <clears throat> we don't exactly judge how much he has learned on the mentor if we bring in artificial intelligence here we can put a ceiling that oh, okay his uh, lesion identifying capacity is more than 70% or 80% then he goes on a live patient his maneuvering possibility uh, uh, capacity is uh, accuracy is more than 
75% he goes on a life real patient and similarly on the other aspects so that actually is the biggest uh, going to be the one of the biggest application and that is going to be the game changer for the training program in endoscopy yeah i dr sunal extension of that question is that the softwares are expensive but once they are very expensive so you and it will also go on changing so once we look at the software can we train our brains to you know work as good as a software uh, the problem is uh, that uh, human brain has a limited capacity limited storage whereas uh, artificial intelligence has unlimited storage and the application can be unlimited and the whole issue is to save uh, the do maximum in uh, minimum amount of time so that the artificial intelligence had the advantage advantage on uh, those fronts you cannot we cannot like uh, your the image i saw i showed you our published uh, our published case of uh, ectopia sebaceous gland in esophagus even despite being in the academic field for uh, 20 25 years we were none of us we were able to recognize with confidence that okay this is uh, it, this can be ectopic ectopic sebaceous gland and this was a 5 minutes job for the ai because ai went through the internet based uh, images matching the images like the google lens matches and then came out with certain suggestion and the top of the list was this ectopic sebaceous gland so this is this becomes very easy for the ai and it is very very difficult for the human brain because simply because of the storage capacity so if you uh, if you read uh, actually um, there is a novel by uh, dan ron so he he has uh, made a concept where there is one artificial intelligence based uh, uh, um, program something like google assistant the the, the way google assistant but he is inter interacting with almost 99 specialties uh, uh scholars of different fields hundreds thousands of scholars in different field at the same time and he is matching at the mental level of the highest in the field so imagine that from 99 specialties thousands of scholars interacting with one ai and the uh, and the ai is matching to there and those scholars didn't have any any clue that he, they are interacting with a with a machine so that is that is the probability uh, that is the limit here okay thank you yes uh, can you tell us how have you made changes in your own endoscopy training areas anybody of you who have dnb students trainees dm trainees dr manjunath and dr lalji can because they are in the training center madam like uh, uh, what we have done is like uh, since like we have only like limited number of seats like we have only two seat dm seats like uh, during covid times also like we had some emergency procedures and all like uh, for us like in ramaya like we have sufficient patients from like uh, esi and other uh, 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 from other uh, uh, centers to our tertiary care center so like uh, we did not feel like uh, we have to train much more than this and uh, we have to extend like what we have done is like uh, we have continued the program uh, during covid also now also now like everyone got vaccinated also like uh, so like uh, we did not think of extending their uh, uh, scheduled uh, like course yeah good morning all uh, ma'am uh, uh, your presentation was very good thank you for all that information and i also echo the same concerns and problems that you faced in our center i'm currently working in cmc vellore and we faced similar problems that you faced number of endoscopies went down to almost zero trainees were struggling they were not getting endoscopy chances but over time yes we have learned from it and uh, the measures that you already suggested we have start taking them uh, the supply of pp unfortunately is not a problem currently so we are doing the procedure we have increased the number of procedures using the pp precautions uh, wherever required we are testing the patients and going ahead with the procedures at a time uh, the procedures were not given to the trainees and it was done by only skilled endoscopists for the risk of dissemination of infection but now with the increasing numbers and uh, with the increased confidence after using pp the trainees are getting uh, enough chances 
so yes things are improving because of our knowledge and i'm hopeful that with the uh, vaccine around the corner we'll be more confident in uh, giving them more chances and exposure uh, exactly same problem that we faced in our center in cmc ma'am whatever you were saying you showed me a graph plot where you showed the numbers coming down and now recently going up it's uh, exactly same pattern that we saw here as well Thank yes. you, thank you, Lalji. Uh, can you wind up, ma'am? Uh, thanks, yeah. all. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bharat, for moderating. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you all. We'll wind up. Thank you.